My name is Renee Clark, and this lecture is over Chapter 2, Variables, Expressions, and Statements from the Think Python eBook. This chapter is getting us started using things such as variables, expressions, and statements in Python. One of the most powerful features of a programming language is the ability to manipulate variables. In Python, we are going to use an assignment statement to create a new variable, giving it a value. Here on the textbook side of the screen, you can see that we have a variable name message that we're using an equal sign to assign it the value of this text string. And now for something completely different. I'm going to go over to my interactive anaconda prompt window for using Python and get started on my Python code. Here I'm going to type message equals quote mark and now for something completely different. When I press enter, that variable now has value of and now for something completely different. In order to get it to be displayed, I'm going to need to print that and I'm going to use the variable name message to make it print out. And there you can see my result. Now they also show in your book putting in n equals 17. So you're setting up the variable n to have a value of 17, an integer, and the variable pi to have the value of pi. And that one is a float because it's got a decimal place and many numbers after the decimal place. All three of these are examples of assignments. You are giving a new variable name and assigning a value to it as part of the program. Now you can think of this as what state the variables are in. And many people will actually create a state diagram such as they are showing here in figure 2.1 to show the state of different variables. Now, right now we only have three, so it's pretty easy to keep track of. But when you begin programming, sometimes you have hundreds of variables if it's a very complex program. And you may need to keep track of their current state when you try to debug a problem that you encounter. So remember, this can be a valuable tool if things aren't working the way you expect them to. Let's look at what are your other options for variable names. A variable name can be as long as you need it to. It can contain both letters and numbers, but it cannot begin with a number. It is legal to use uppercase letters, but it's conventional to use mostly lowercase. There are some cases where, as we get further into the material, you will see that it becomes useful to use a combination of upper and lower. They give you three examples here that all result in invalid syntax error. 76 trombones seems reasonable, but in fact it doesn't work because it's starting with a number. While you can put numbers in variable names, they cannot start with that. You can also put underscores in variable names. Here's an example, air speed of an unladen swallow. Here we have one more with an at. Now that one doesn't work because the at symbol does not belong in there. It's not allowed. Only letters, numbers, and an underscore. This last one, class, seems to be a valid variable name, but in fact it is a reserved word in Python or a Python keyword. Here you'll see we have a group of Python keywords. These are words that already have special meaning in Python. You therefore cannot use them when creating a variable name. Expressions and statements. Here we have the ability to just put in an expression and Python will tell us what's going on. So now if I type in, it will tell me the result current value is 17. I can also add something to the value in n, and that gives us 42. Now, when I entered n equals 17 again, in order to see it, I have to either call n or I have to print it. So just like I printed my message above, I can print my n. 
Let's next look at the difference that we can, different ways of programming. We're seeing right over here on the right side of the screen an interactive window. We'll want to write programs that are longer than one line of code. So we'll go and switch here. I've got a place on this side of this, on the left side of this window, right in here, where you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is where I will type a program in. And the results, once I run that program, and then I have a run button up here, or I can press F5, will display over here in this console. If I'm creating plots, it might show up here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start using Python as a calculator, much as the example here in the textbook shows. But instead of doing it in the interactive window, I'm going to do it in a script. So this is a program I'm creating. And I start with some basics. Now, I need to save my program. And then I'm going to run it. Now you can see over here the result printed out right here. It says run file, and it gives the location of it, and then it prints the results. It's going to print out the 42.182 because I actually used it inside of the print command. I could go ahead and I could modify this. I'm going to leave blank lines to allow a little spacing. Watch what happens when I press 5 and run that. I don't get the 5. Then I'm going to do x equals 5. Let's see what that does. Again, don't get it. And if I do x plus 1, still don't get it. All of these are being run, but they're not showing as output because I'm working in a scripted window. So in order to get them to show, I'm going to need to add print statements around them, such as this. Now you can see, not only do I get the 42.182, I also get the 6. Within Python, orders of operations, just like you use for mathematical operators, the conventions stay the same. So keep that in mind that you'll need to refer back to these old standards from your math class when doing coding and programming. You can also do things with string operators. You see here that we have some string operators. Here we're seeing Chinese as a string minus food. That's illegal. Eggs divided by easy, illegal. Third times a charm. These are all illegal because you can't take a word times a word. You can't divide a word by a word. You can't subtract a word from a word. However, you can do multiplication and addition in certain circumstances. Here's an example. We've set up a variable to be equal to the string throat. We've set up another variable to be equal to warbler. We can add first and second, and it will actually show us the throat warbler. I'm going to go ahead and add that to this program. So first equals throat, second equals warbler. And I'm going to enclose in the print statement the first plus second, so that we'll see the result print out. And you'll see here, there's my result printing out of throat warbler. I can also do some basic um, multiplication. So instead of using first plus second, I'm going to put first times four. Now I get throat, 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 throat four times. So you can see it works easily enough in certain situations, make sure you understand how you can use mathematical functions on a string. Next is comments. Comments are very useful when you're creating programs because programs are going to be fairly big and complex in many cases. And not everyone can easily understand the code as it gets more and more complex. So you might add a comment using the number, the pound sign, in front of a block of code to indicate what it's going to do. 
So here we have the comment, compute the percentage of the hour that has elapsed. And then below it, we have an assignment statement that will do that for them. You can also put it after, on the same line as the assignment statement, anything following that pound sign will be a comment. There are other ways to do commenting. You can do what they've done here. We have three double quotations, and then we have two th lines of text, a blank line, and three more double quotations. This is a multi-line comment. So anything between the three starting and the three following is going to be viewed as a comment by your program. It is important to not make your statements, your comment statements, kind of useless. Here we have V equals 5, and the comment the programmer puts is assign 5 to V. Not at all useful. Explaining that V is representing velocity in meters per second is a more useful comment about what the code V equals 5 does. Now, when it comes to debugging, we're going to keep talking about this as each chapter goes on. There are three basic types of error messages that you're going to get in programs. Syntax, runtime, and semantic. Syntax are those that are related to the structure, the kind of the grammar of programming. That's going to get you a syntax error if you violate one of those. They're pretty easy to resolve. Runtime errors, so-called because the error does not appear until after the program has started running, these are going to be exceptions, and they usually indicate something pretty big and bad. We won't be seeing a lot of runtime errors given the type of programs that we're working in because they're so simple. And then the third type of error is the semantic error. So this is going to relate to what is your program trying to do and is it doing that. So it will run, it doesn't generate any error messages, but the output you get isn't really what you thought you were going to get. Could be because you haven't quite got the program set up right. It's a little harder to understand. It's often good to run a program using test data that you know what the result should be. That way you can determine whether or not there is a semantic error. Again, we have the glossary section, and please remember that these may or may not have been used in the text, and you need to know all of them. If you have any questions, consult your professor.